Okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, we have uh, Dr. Fiona Edward Murphy and uh, Dr. Pori Whelan here with, uh, from uh, Appybox, who are going to talk about their, their technology used to monitor hives. So I'll just hand over to you guys. Where you go? Great. Thanks so much, Brendan. Um, so I'm just going to share my slides here. So I've got a bit of a visual aid. Um, so thanks so much, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, so I'm uh, Dr. Fiona Edwards-Murphy. I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of Apis Protect. And uh, here with me today is Padraig Whelan, or Dr. Padraig Whelan, who is our Chief Science Officer and co-founder. Um, so to start off with, well, first of all, we'll give we'll talk for maybe about, about half an hour about you know our background, our history, where we came from, and um, what we're up to, to today at the moment. And um, then afterwards, we'll do some some Q and A. If anybody has any questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. Uh, so to start out with, uh, my own background. So I am an electrical engineer. Uh, so my, my background is in uh, sensor technologies. Uh, I was studying electrical and electronic engineering at, at UCC. Um, absolutely fell in love with the area of sensor technologies and sensor applications. Uh, the field, the specific field I was working in was called wireless sensor networks back in you know, 2010 when I started working in it. It's gone through about eight different change, name changes in the meantime, now it's called the Internet of Things. Uh, I don't really like that name because it makes what, what we do sound a lot more intimidating than it is. I, I know a lot of people kind of roll their eyes and get exhausted when they hear the phrase Internet of Things, when really what that means is putting sensors into the real world and finding useful real world applications for sensor technologies. Uh, so while I was at, at UCC, uh, I worked on a, a variety of different applications, really fell in love with, with um, using sensors to uh, impact and improve the real world. So I worked on projects like uh, structural health monitoring, so working, developing sensors to be used in uh, bridge and tunnel construction in Italy uh, to make sure that there wasn't any uh, damage to the structure, that structures they were boring under, or uh, any health and safety risks on the bridge. Uh, worked on some human health applications, so identifying um, uh, problems for pregnant women in the developing world. Uh, also on um, education as well, so using sensor technology to improve uh, the learning experiences provided by toys. So just really loved um, using sensors to, to make the real world um, more user friendly for, for people, uh, make the, your, the experience in the real world um, easier and better by giving access to more data. And back in 2012 uh, was when I first started learning about bees and beekeeping. And I absolutely fell in love with um, the, the hive and everything that goes on inside of it. And uh, the first thing that I thought was, this is an amazing place to put, put some sensors. Uh, in particular, because at that stage, there was an awful lot of um, you know, news articles and stuff like that about colony collapse disorder over in the US. And basically everybody was saying, there's this problem, nobody knows what's causing it, nobody knows, nobody can predict it happening, nobody really understands what's going on here. And I was like, just use some sensors, collect some data, find out something um, you know, about what's going on. Um, so that's when I started working on sensor technologies in beehives. Uh, I never did monitor a hive of colony collapse disorder, <laughs> still haven't to this day. Uh, but um, what, I, what I started uh, in 2013 was my PhD, um, so specifically on wireless sensor, net wireless sensor network applications uh, for uh, honeybees. Uh, my purpose there was to try and see which sensors could tell you information about the beehive, which ones could provide useful information for uh, scientific research into what's going on inside the beehives. So at that stage, I hadn't really thought about taking sensors into the real world. I was still very much uh, wrapped up in academia. Podrick was actually uh, one of my PhD supervisors. <laughs> so that's how I met Podrick. Um, his beehives were the, the guinea pigs <laughs> for my PhD. And um, over the four years, I basically put every single sensor I could get my hands on inside my beehive, um, started seeing what could I do, what information could I extract, and how could that information be used. Um, what I found was really interesting, uh, which was, first of all, it, uh, it's, it's possible to detect or, or analyze what's going on inside in the beehive pretty effectively uh, remotely. So basically looking at the patterns in the data from the sensors, you can identify what's actually happening inside in the beehive at that time. 
And um, that's when the idea of using sensor technologies to remotely detect what's going on inside beehives um, kind of started becoming more clear to me. Um, also, during my PhD, I had the opportunity to learn an awful lot about beekeeping, about beekeeping around the globe, how, how big of an industry, how many beekeepers there are out there, and um, that there's really a need for a technology to help beekeepers understand what's happening inside their beehives remotely and help them identify uh, where their skills can be best applied. Because um, fr from what I've seen, um, there isn't really one specific problem that that's led to uh, beekeeping becoming more difficult over time. The biggest problem is that there are so many problems to deal with. And so getting more data and getting more information um, can really help beekeepers to uh, apply the skills and techniques that they have, the solutions to the problems that they have, apply them in the right place at the right time and improve the effectiveness of those techniques. Um, so that's my history. That's what led me up to Apis Protect, uh, co-founded Apis Protect with Paul Drig in 2017. And I guess I'll let Paul Drig introduce himself before I get into what we've been up to since 2017. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Padraig Whelan. Um, I'm a long-term member of Hibka, um, and I, I did my first course in Gormanstown in 2004 um, after bees landed in my roof and I decided I'd take up beekeeping. Um, I'm a bit older than Fiona and um, I've got a background uh, working in Latin America in the Galapagos Islands and in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. Um, I have had a teaching job in UCC for 21 years um, and at, during that stage I supervised several research projects on honeybees but you know also marine biology and terrestrial ecology and uh, plant ecology um, and uh, decided to take early retirement uh, to join Fiona in setting up Apis Protect um, so we did that about four years ago now and um, we set up the company. So um, I'm the original beekeeper with Apis Protect, a um, couple more in the group now, and um, I can speak Spanish as well. So our language comes in, that language comes in particularly handy um, when working in the US, because many of the, the people who work in beekeeping from the US um, come up on visas from Central America to work during the busy seasons. So uh, it's a very interesting job. It's very mixed. Um, I certainly, took our retirement with the idea of keeping busy and I'm well busy, I'll tell you that. And it's good to talk to members of FIBCA again. Some of you will know me. Oh, sorry, I was having trouble with my unmute button wasn't talking to me. Padraig, can you, can you just confirm you can hear me again? Yes, perfect. Okay, cool, sorry, I was just worried. <laughs> okay, thanks Padraig, okay. that's great. Um, so when we founded Apis Protect, oh, my whole laptop is there we go. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, so when we founded Apis Protect in 2017, um, our objective was to help beekeepers, like I mentioned there, um, get more information about what's happening in their apiary without needing to travel to the apiary, suit up, uh, and dig around inside the beehive. Um, essentially what we saw was that the, the problem, like I mentioned, is that there are so many problems for beekeepers to address at the same time. Um, so what we saw out there was that there, there's a core colony condition because of the sheer volume of, of problems that are going on and the fact that um, a lot of the time beekeepers find themselves uh, firefighting uh, rather than trying to, um, um, you know, understanding what's going on and fixing it in advance. Um, there's also problems, especially in, in large operations of labor. Uh, labor is very expensive. Uh, beekeeping is a, is a skilled activity and trying to source people to help scale up beekeeping uh, can be quite difficult. Uh, traditional beekeeping itself struggles to scale. I and mean, in particular, uh, we deal with a lot of operations in the US that could have thousands or even tens of thousands of beehives. And um, when you try to scale up traditional beekeeping, you know, like that drive out in your van a couple of hours to get to your yard, suit up, pull apart every single beehive and, you know, apply treatments to every single beehive, feed every single beehive, um, uh, understand what's happening, queenlessness, things like that. When you've got tens of thousands of beehives, it becomes a, a, a logistical nightmare. Um, and as well as that, we saw that there had been um, a lot of poor translation of the um, scientific knowledge into practical beekeeping. So there's a lot of information uh, that's been 
investigated really only in laboratory conditions and you know conclusions that people have come to and then it hasn't really made it into the real world of beekeeping because um, because of the sheer volume of of work that beekeepers have to do you don't have time to do these extra steps or these extra slightly new techniques and stuff like that to um, to actually further improve the conditions um, in, in the operation so what we wanted to do was set out to um, create a sensor technology that could go inside the beehive, uh, collect data, send that data, so the raw data from the beehive back to our servers, uh, apply uh, a technique that's called machine learning, which I'll, I'll explain a bit more in a minute, in order to translate that raw data into useful information uh, about the beehives themselves. Um, so the objective behind that was rather than making beekeepers, uh, you know, spend a lot of time um, thinking and analyzing the data to try and process it a little bit in order to help them understand what's happening inside of the beehive a little bit faster and to, to get that, the, get from temperature graphs and, and humidity graphs to um, a little bit more information about what's happening in the hives uh, as quickly as possible so that the information um, is more accessible and, and more usable for, for the beekeeper. And as well as that, it's obviously all completely remote. So the data is collected from the beehive, transmitted back to our servers, and then sent to, directly to the beekeeper via you know, text, email, or, or through our web, web portal. So machine learning is uh, a core concept of artificial intelligence. Um, so it's kind of um, artificial, artificial intelligence is a, is a group of computer science techniques of which machine learning is one. Uh, so essentially what machine learning is, it's how um, Netflix understands what kind of movies you like, it's how uh, self-driving cars are able to identify who's a pedestrian or what's a stop sign, what's a red light look like, um, it's how Spotify also knows what kind of music you like, um, can't think of any more uh, real world machine learning examples, but essentially it's a really, really powerful computer and you give that computer um, as many examples as you can find of the kind of information you'd like it to be able to identify. And then in the future, you're able to give it new data and it will, it will look back into the past, think about what it's seen before and judge what's happening now based on the information it's seen in the past. So the, the real beauty of machine learning is that it learns in the same way that, that the human brain, learn, brain learns. It learns from experience and it's able to correct itself over time. So as, as it gets things wrong, it's able to identify, oh, whoops, I got that one wrong. Let's improve my technique for looking at things so that I don't get this wrong again. Um, and how we're using machine learning at Apis Protect is we've spent um, a, a long time in the field uh, collecting examples of real world beehives that are healthy, unhealthy, um, big, small, things like that. We've um, collected over 15 million data points actually about uh, real world beehives. And what that's, what that's done is enabled us to learn an awful lot about what beehives look like, what, what healthy beehives look like, what unhealthy beehives look like. Um, and we're able to now use that knowledge that our big computer has in order to um, help beekeepers identify what's going on inside of their operation. Uh, so that's uh, where I get on to our, our story about validation. Um, so when we set out to start APIS Protect in 2017, uh, we realized that there was a huge undertaking here to, to learn about beehives all over the globe and to learn what the beekeeping industry was like all over the globe. Um, so we started out uh, with um, a small team uh, getting ready to go all over the globe to uh, roll out our technology. Um, so first, the first job that we did was uh, we raised uh, one and a half million euro and uh, from, from a venture capital fund or from multiple ones actually <laughs> and then we spent uh, the next two years uh, rolling out our technology or the first prototypes of our technology all over the globe so 400 hives across the USA, um, Ireland, the UK and South Africa <coughs> excuse me uh, we had 20 beekeepers working with us uh, across those locations, um, helping us to collect data and to understand what was happening inside their beehives. So we're, we're very thankful to our, our beekeepers and some of our Irish beekeepers might be here today. I'm not sure. I didn't, I, there's 94 of these, so I can't scroll through and check. Uh, but if you are, thank you very much for helping us. <laughs> and um, essentially what that did was it allowed us to build up our uh, data set, our 15 million data point data point. Uh, beehive data set 
uh, that now drives our machine learning that helps us identify what's going on inside the beehives all over the globe in a, as many different situations as we can. So I've got some photos here. Obviously, that was a pretty fun adventure uh, following our beehive technology all over the globe. Um, so I've got some pictures here. This first one is South Africa, definitely. Yeah, so that was Podrick did that deployment. That was a fun trip. Uh, the next one here, that's the desert in California. And then we've got the desert, desert in Arizona. So just two different kinds of desert. And this is in the Peak District in, uh, in England. So up in, in the mountains in, in uh, England. So we got sea beehives in very, very different conditions and look at beehives um, in about as hot as you can get beehives, about as cold, about as extreme in every direction. Um, and that was a really interesting adventure. So uh, we learned an awful lot about beehives. We learned an awful lot about data. We learned an awful lot about what our hardware should be like. So we've gone through uh, three hardware revisions over the last four years. And now we finally got to this device here. Um, Podrick has one that's actually the correct color. Oh, well, yeah. Well, Podrick, pull it up again there, Podrick. That's our very first prototype from 20, late 2017, early 2018. Um, so that's the version that's going out there in these photos. And then that's the second hardware revision, the smaller black box. And then this is our final product. So you can see uh, one of the most important features is that it's very thin. So it's uh, 15 millimeters tall, uh, which is three fifths of an inch because I'm used to talking to American beekeepers. <laughs> so I know metric and imperial off the top of my head. Um, so the purpose of that is it's thin enough to fit into every kind of beehive that we've encountered across the globe, including um, the pollination beehives in the US. So those are the beehives that they've got that are designed to be stacked, um, you know, uh, fitting 400 hives onto the back of a truck to transport them across the country to California for the almonds. Um, so it fits into whatever beehive you can throw at it. Um, it's very robust. It's been, we're, we're, we are uh, engineers and uh, it's designed by engineers. So it's been designed to survive the real world of agriculture and the real world of beekeeping. So, you know, you can take your lid off. So it gets installed under the roof of the beehive. You can take it off, throw it on the ground, stack your supers on, supers on top and you don't need to worry about damaging the, the unit. It's water resistant, it's propolis resistant, it's bee resistant. <laughs> um, and it's, um, it's designed to survive in the real world of beekeeping. Uh, it's also powered by AAA batteries. And the purpose of that is the batteries are completely disposable. Um, our first version, the, the large VHS cassette sized one that Quadric held up, that was powered by a uh, lithium ion battery. So rechargeable batteries, kind of similar to what's in your phone. And as you can see in these pictures, that was recharged by a, a solar panel. Um, so we moved away from that idea when we realized that when you have uh, disease outbreaks or uh, if you've got a problem in your hives that you need to disinfect it or destroy it, a lithium ion battery, if you get it wet or you dip it in bleach or you try to set it on fire, it's essentially a hand grenade, uh, it will explode and be very, very dangerous. So uh, we moved over to disposable batteries. Uh, so now we've got, uh, it runs on three AAA batteries. It gets over two years of lifespan off those three AAA batteries. So it's still got a very good lifespan. And also if in the worst, when the worst comes to the worst and you want to destroy the hive or destroy the unit or disinfect the unit, you just pop the batteries out and put them in bleach and you don't explode. <laughs> um, so we've learned an awful lot of engineering, knowledge, we've learned a lot of data science knowledge and a lot of beekeeping knowledge. Um, so here's um, what an in-field setup of our technology looks like today. So it's entirely self-installed by the beekeeper, it can be installed in well less than two minutes. It's just two screws. So there's a screw on each end. It's installed right underneath the roof. So it's kind of hanging, hanging above the, the feet hole if you've got one or above the frames if you don't have a crown board. And um, there's no equipment required except a screwdriver. Um, so the whole point, one of our, our core objectives at Apis Protect is that um, we don't want the beekeeper to have to know anything about technology or to learn anything about technology to, to use our solution. So um, we handle things like we handle all of the communication. So it's got a SIM card inside when it arrives and we handle all of the communication. Um, all you need is a screwdriver to install it. You're not going to need to learn how to connect up wires or um, I don't know, set up giant base stations in, in the case of our, our Irish deployments or um, you know, learn how to subscribe and set up a machine-to-machine -machine sim 
Um, so it's basically, it's, it's completely plug and play. Uh, that was uh, one of our core objectives. We don't want to make people stop beekeeping and start maintaining technology. That, that really doesn't sound like a fun, <laughs> a fun change of, of, of activity. Um, so uh, the other thing that I'm really proud that we've built over the last few years is our team. So we've got a team of 10 based in Ireland. So we do all of our research and development. All of our manufacturing is done in Ireland as well. So we manufacture everything in, in Shannon at the moment. Uh, so we've got a team of 10. We're based in Cork. We're still based in Cork. Uh, we've moved out to, to, to CIT, to the Rubicon, to anyone who knows Cork. So we've uh, moved uh, from one university to the other, or uh, to MTU now. And uh, we've got a team of 10 of engineers, data science, uh, scientists, beekeepers, um, marketing and, and business development experts. So we've really uh, built out our team and we're ready to, to take on the world with our technology. And some of the, the key benefits that we help, that we, we feel our technology can help beekeepers do, uh, manage time and resources more effectively, check remotely on beehives uh, anywhere, anytime, evaluate the condition of the colony and identify colonies, weak colonies for intervention. And by doing these things, the, the results and the impact on, on, on beekeepers' lives is, first of all, uh, improved apiary management, uh, secondly, increased production, uh, fewer losses, and just peace of mind. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Podrick in a minute uh, to talk a, a bit about uh, the, the technology that we have available in Ireland. Um, so in December, we launched our uh, solution for, for U.S. beekeepers. So in the USA, we work with um, commercial beekeepers servicing the pollination and the honey industries. Um, so we've been uh, working with beekeepers over there since December. And as of January, uh, we launched the pre-order of our technology for Ireland. So um, our technology, if you're interested in a, a purchasing unit or um, pre-booking a unit, uh, they're available on our website. Uh, it's limited stock for 2020, uh, so uh, we're limiting it to 200 units. That's the, the size of the manufacturing batch that we're doing for this year. So um, it's advised to book in advance because they're selling pretty quickly. We're very happy with that. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll be confirming a delivery date uh, for those units um, in the, the next couple of weeks. Uh, so we're, we're uh, just working with our, our suppliers in China and Ireland and all of the other places in between uh, to uh, make sure that we can confirm a, a final delivery date as soon as possible. So, Podrick, over to you. Yeah, so thanks, Fiona. Um, I just, some of the points Fiona's already mentioned on this first slide, um, but as I see it, uh, you know, Fiona's mentioned the management of time and resources, and this is particularly important when you're a very large operation, as in some of the gangs we meet in the United States. Um, again, Fiona's mentioned about the monitoring your hives remotely. Um, you know, if you're running, you know, 50 apiaries um, and you want to find out which is the one you should be going to today, um, this is the way our technology is used. That, that doesn't come in so much into the hobbyist version at the moment. Um, one of the things about it is um, we don't do a diagnosis of what's going on inside in the hive. We rely on you as the beekeeper to recognize what the conditions are because you know we wouldn't pretend to say that with our sensors we can tell you that you've got American fowl brood or you know that you've got chalk brood um, or that your space is too small um, or your bees are crowded and um, we can certainly give you some ideas about the sort of physical conditions inside in the hive but we're relying on telling you that certain hive needs attention and you go and look at that hive um, and you do the diagnosis and take the action on the basis of that. Um, so when we're talking about out, out, identifying outliers in your apiary, you know, once you have a few of these monitors going, you begin to see that they don't all behave in exactly the same way. And the outlier is, is you know, the kind of one you need to pay attention to. And as I was saying to your chair at the start of the meeting, you know, if you have 20 hives and you want to inspect those 20 hives, well, you know, it could take up the best part of a Sunday afternoon if you're going to look at them all in detail. Um, whereas if you have these monitors, can say well you know there's only four of those that are really not just working the same as everything else so maybe if I'm in a hurry I'll just look at those four um, and it allows you more time on a Sunday afternoon or obviously if you're a commercial beekeeper and you're handling you know a thousand hives you know you might end up being able to handle a thousand five hundred if you've got a labor saving device that allows you effectively to inspect the hives without opening them um, and obviously the other part about this is, you know, every time you open a hive, there's a risk of crushing a queen, killing a queen. You know, the queen might fly out, not come back. She can get eaten by a bird or things like that. So, um, you know, 
reducing the number of times you open a hive is, is important. And of course, the other one is, I'm not sure that we realize it or I realized it before I kind of had the monitors. But when you open a hive and you go through the frames, it takes several hours for the bees to settle back into their pattern. Sometimes I was looking at one last week and it took over 12 hours for the bees to reestablish the same pattern as they'd had before that and a pattern that matched all the other hives. So this kind of avoids it. And then the way we do this is we're taking temperature, humidity and sound inside in the hive. And by looking at those parameters, you as a beekeeper will begin to so, sort of tell is one hive warmer than the other? You know, is one hive damper than the other? I had a hive recently and there was a leaky roof in it. You know, the humidity was very high around the monitors. Um, then also there's ways of visualizing the data. So making you making it easier for you to compare the data. Um, and then we have these um, real time alerts that we can give you. And one of the most interesting one is the, uh, the movement alert. And uh, we had thought of this, you know, it was part of a package we got really. And um, more and more people are getting interested in this. Uh, some monitors, some hive monitors have GPS inside in them, but that makes them more expensive. Um, so what we have something that if the hive is moved up, down or left or right, or if the roof is moved up, down, down or left or right, an immediate message will go back to the base station, which we can send to you as a mobile, um, or go to the cloud, which we can then send to you a mobile to say that hive has been touched. And we've met cases, you know, a case in Ireland where somebody said, it's a pity I didn't have that because I had hives and animal broke, animals broke in from the field next door. They knocked the hives over. It was the middle of winter. And I didn't know about this until all the bees were dead in the rain and the cold. Um, if you got an alert, you'd have a quicker chance of going back. We've had other examples where I'd phone up some, somebody in the States and I said, oh, I see you guys are working in this apiary today. And they said, no, we're not. There should be nobody there. And I said, well, the roofs are being moved. And so they'd send somebody out for a look and they came back and said it was a bear, you know. Um, so, and then we've other people who are, who are interested in installing it because they don't want anybody messing with their hive. So if, if anybody lifts the roof on the hive, they'll get a, an alert to that. And then obviously the other thing is because we're monitoring weather conditions in the area and the conditions in the hive, nearly all the miticide treatments have, you know, minimum and maximum and humid temperatures and humidity values that you should be using for the application of miticide treatment. So it becomes less hit and miss when we can tell you conditions are now appropriate for this. You can then log information on the hive as well um, as to what you've done, when you've done it, uh, what times you've done it, what the weather was like if you want. Can you go to the next one, please, Fiona? <clears throat> so when you log into our website, this is one of the first things you see and you have, a, you, you have your own password and you get a panel of information which gives you, this is your dashboard, what we call it, and um, you've got a user manual in there, and there are reports and user profile. So um, here's an example from an apiary in the States, um, in which it tells you, firstly, you've got 15 hives. You've got three of them with temperatures that are either lower or higher than most of the other ones. You've got some humidity ones, some that are either damp or more dry, um, and other ones that are making either too much or too little sound compared to all the other ones. And you can produce graphs on that. So then here, no, it's all right, go to the next ones. Yeah. Um, so then this is the kind of detail that you look for. So you can see at the top, running across the top, you have conditions for weather and weather forecasts. Um, and from there then you can see little kind of cartoons of each of the hives. Above that you have what's called an apiary chart, which you can um, click that button and all the hives will come out at the same time and you can compare all the hives with one another. But here then, when you see the picture of the hives standing up straight, it means that hive has not been touched or knocked. If you look in the second row, you have number five, four, five, and you can see the hive is on its side. There's two of them there. That means somebody has lifted the lid um, on the hive or somebody has bumped it or knocked it. Now, in some cases, we have uh, a hive that's in a black color, which means that hive is dead because we've looked at the temperature, you've looked at the humidity, you've looked at the sound, and it tells us the hive is dead and you'll get an image of that. And we have what Fiona called our machine learning for detecting whether the hive is dead. And we will always kind of, I suppose over exaggerate is the word. If there's 10 dead hives, we'll probably tell you that there's 12 because there's one or two we're not sure of, but we'd rather send you to 12 hives to have you check than actually send it to nine and find out there's another dead one that we've missed. Um, 
So you, we can also tell the, the battery levels down there as well, and it tells you the transmission signal systems. So that'll be the first one you go into, and you can look at that as individual hives, or you can press a pre-chart and get them all out together. So if you go to the next one now, please. Um, this would be a typical sort of temperature chart, and you can set, you know, the, the first date and time, the second date, you know, beginning and end of the, the period that you want to look at, and you can switch on which hives you're looking at. So if you look at the left-hand side, you'll see temperature, and underneath you have the uh, the blue, the three blue stripes. You have hive 540, hive 543, and five, five, 544 turned on. So you, you'll put those in, you'll click on the start date and the end date, and you'll click search, and it'll produce a graph like this. And if you look on the horizontal line under the graph, you have got the different times and dates across there on the horizontal axis. You, on the vertical axis, you have the temperature. And this is obviously not Ireland at this time of the year because the temperatures are 10 to 15 um, there. This is in the Southern United States. And then what you'll see is the red line on the bottom. And if you look at the key underneath on the horizontal line, that's your external temperature. And if you look at those hives, the, the three lines, there's a blue line, an orange line, and a green line. You'll see that the green hive, the, the trace for the green hive from about midways on is beginning to very closely resemble the trace of the red line. So the green and the red are the lowest lines on those graphs there. So 544 is the green line and red is the external temperature line. And you begin to see there that because the red, the green hive is beginning to behave exactly the same as the external temperatures, um, you begin to say that hive is probably dead. Um, and you will have seen it sort of dying earlier on because even if you move to the um, left-hand portion of the graph, you can see that the green, green line is close to the external temperature line. It's much closer than the blue line or than the orange line. And you can see that the blue line, blue trace on the graph is always the warmest of the hives there. You can run a similar one for humidity and damper hives will show up, you know, with the trace much higher um, and drier hives will work at the lower one. So I'll give you an example of this the other day. I was, um, I hadn't opened my hives for a while because the weather was cool. Um, and I was saying, well, I'm gonna wait till 10 degrees and a sunny day to open my hives. But one of them was giving me a trace, a bit like the red one on this graph that was much lower than all the other ones. And I knew it was a weak hive going into the, into October. And I said, you know, I can see the temperature is still warmer than the outside one. So the bees are alive, but they're not keeping it very warm. So maybe there's too much empty space in the hive and the bees are not keeping it warm. So having looked at that trace, I went to the hive, I took off the roof and I had a look inside and there were several frames in which the bees had eaten all the honey out of. So out of the 11 frames in the national hive, there was probably six that were completely empty, which was effectively just empty airspace. And there was enough bees in there, but it was still a small colony. So what I did is, is I kind of isolated the colony up to one side and put kind of packing insulation and um, still to allow the bees to go in and out. And the temperature now within an hour of that, you know, was gone up to a temperature which was higher than all the other hives. So, you know, based on the information I saw on the graph, I was able to take action and change the conditions within the hive. And, you know, within a few hours, able to say that hive is behaving the way I think it should. Can you go on to the next slide, please, Fiona? Um, you can also add um, other features to this. You'll see that on the, you know, under the red bar, under where it says April chart and weather chart, after the date and time, you'll see sunrise, sunset. So you can click that on and that will tell you when sunrise and sunset is there. And, you know, you'll see there that in the early morning is when the temperatures are coldest. Um, and in the evening, late afternoon is when the temperatures are highest. And if you begin to see that, you know, pattern working fine all the time, you know you're okay. But if it's something doesn't begin to follow that again, you can say to yourself, you know, um, these, these bees are not behaving the way they should. Do you want to go to the next one? Yeah, okay, that's it. Um, so there's, we're, we're developing lots of other things. Um, you know, I didn't show you the humidity. Um, the sound graphs obviously will tell you some hives are noisier than others. Um, they, and, and some of them are just are. Um, we, we haven't figured out exactly why. Um, but obviously if you're in an area where there's a lot of traffic, you know, it'll, it'll pick up the cars going by. So you need to keep that in mind. But, but temperature and humidity are very important in telling you what's going on in the hive. We've also been developing other aspects. Um, 
which relate to the demands of the US market, which might have relevance here as well um, in terms of research. And we're, we're, we're regularly being asked now, not so much by the US beekeepers because they tend to have a very good handle on swarm control because the minute the hive gets big, they'll split the hive because obviously they want more hives to go to almonds in January. Um, so they'll split the hive, so they're avoiding the swarming response. Whereas here from hobbyist beekeepers, people will say, can you tell swarming? And that's one of the areas in which we're working now at the moment um, to, to try and develop a advanced warning. There are other sets of equipment that will give you advanced warning of swarming, but it's actually within half an hour of the bees about to leave the hive, which you mightn't get to anyway, or else it's they'll tell you they have just swarmed, which means they're hopefully sitting in the bush. But we're, we're hoping to get a little bit earlier than that so as to advise people uh, on that. So we're interested in, in ideas that people want us to develop. Um, we've some developed, lots of them ongoing. Um, so yeah, that's my bit there. Great, thanks, Padraig. Um, fantastic, so I guess we're on to, well, I guess, first of all, Apis Protect, it's www.apisprotect.com. If you'd like to learn more, there's a lot of information up on our website. Uh, there is also an email address on there. It's inquiries with an E um, at apisprotect.com. Um, if you've got any questions, I know there's loads of questions coming in, so we'll, we'll answer those in a minute. Or social media, we're at Apis Protect on you know, Twitter, Facebook, whatever social media you like to use. You can talk to us there. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll stop screen sharing so we can see each other. Okay, we have a few questions. Um, so. David asks, what does Apis Protect offer the beekeeper that other monitoring solutions don't? That's a really good question. Um, so I think that the key thing that we do at Apis Protect is that we offer the best combination of price and features. Uh, so we've got some of the most advanced features available on the market um, for one of the lowest prices. I can't say for sure that we are the cheapest technology available, but certainly if you compare our technology with other technologies at a similar price point. Uh, so what we do is we collect the data. So we've got the sensor, a very, very high quality sensor. Uh, we've got the fact that we do all the data collection. A lot of other solutions out there uh, require you to buy a SIM, insert the SIM, manage the SIM yourself and stuff like that. We take all of that stuff off your plate completely included in the price. And uh, then we provide uh, the, the, the feedback, the information, and as well as that, and the analysis um, on top of it. So, you know, things like it's identifying the outliers. There's very few products available on the market that do that at this price point. Um, as well as that, I think um, one of my, my favorite thing, I mean, like being an, being an engineer, I'm biased, obviously, but one of my favorite things about our product is that we built our product from the ground up uh, we are, um, we've got the engineers, the software developers, the data scientists. So first of all, we're able to provide the best, the best quality product because we are the people managing the whole thing. We're not outsourcing any part of what we're doing to anyone else in the world. Uh, and as well as that, we put, we understand what we're doing because we are the beekeepers who've developed this technology. Um, other teams in the market are either beekeepers developing a, a technology product, you know, which is great and fun, but it's not a great way to deliver a brilliant engineering product. Or they're engineers or software developers who are building something who don't really understand beekeeping and they'll never end up developing something that really works. Uh, so we've been in the field, like literally data scientists standing in the field, dealing with the consequences of their own data science. Uh, so the, the quality and the consistency of our product is really unparalleled as far as I'm concerned. There's something else I should add as well is that, you know, um, you look at other products there and some of them have different components. For instance, they, they, they might have a weighing scales and the weighing scales will lead to a wire, which leads to a solar panel on the mm -hmm. roof or leads to a transmission box, which is in the roof. Um, and, you know, we've been through the, the wire stage when we had the solar panels on our roofs as well. Um, you know, we were powering them with wire as well at some stage. And, you know, we've had cows eat the wires. We've had, you know, rodents in deserts eat the wires. And, you know, that's why we've eventually come back to this one in which it's attached to the roof. The, you know, the antennas within that, the power source is within that. There's no wires going anywhere. And what you do is you just take the roof off. Well, actually, it'll sit this way in your hive. You take the roof off the hive. You put the roof upside down and you can put your supers on top of it, um, you know, in the typical way that you'd, you'd work with your hive anyway. Um, and, you know, we've had people pour water on them. We have somebody who thought that the, the roof of the hive should be left facing the sky. Um, so, it, it, you know, the roof was full of water the next morning and the, the poor monitor was drowned. Um, but basically we, we opened it up and we dried it out and it was fine. You know? um, 
it's designed for that kind of work. We wouldn't recommend that you do that though. <laughs> no, 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 no. For various <laughs> no reasons. Guarantee. There's no guarantee going with it. Okay, the next so question from Tingle. If I wanted to put your center in one of our association highs to assist in education of beginners, can I publish some of your graphs or data directly on an association website via API codes? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, we do have an API. We, we, it's not a publicly available API, but I'm sure um, our, like that, again, because we developed everything that we've got, I'm sure that the, the lads on our software team could, could arrange that. Um, obviously, all of the data is your data, so you're free to do what you want with it. So um, I'm sure it's just a case of Andy, our software developer, linking you up with our API. That's certainly manageable. Um, <clears throat> what made you decide to do a global rollout? Why didn't you focus on one country first and get that down? Yeah, that's, that's okay. a good question as well. Yes. Uh, uh, um, I, I'm, the, I'm the biologist here. Um, <laughs> so, so, so basically, what, what we, we obviously, there are different beekeeping industries in different countries, uh, different continents. So, you know, the, in the Americas, North and South America, you know, it's the European honeybee and, you know, in South and now Central America, um, Apis mellifera scutellata, you know, hybridizing with it. Um, and so then when you look at it, you know, Australia and Tasmania have Apis mellifera mellifera, and you've got Apis mellifera capensis in the Cape Town area of Africa, Apis mellifera scutellata, um, north of that. Um, so, so honeybees kind of occur in several different kind of climates, you know, between desert and temperate forest, and humid tropical. Um, and it turns out, you know, that the USA being, a, sorry, North America being a very large continent has most of the kind of climates that honeybees, you know, are commercially used in. Um, the USA is kind of our nearest neighbor on the other side. Um, and also, you know, we have the English language common with them as well. We, we already, I'd already worked on a project, uh, PhD um, with the USDA. So we had contacts there. And you know the kind of business network between Ireland and the USA was very good, so we 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 kind of focused a lot. I think most of our deployment was in the USA. Um, yeah. But but you know South Africa has its own interesting stories, and I mean here's a here's a yarn I tell people, it's it's, it's true, um, where we had this South African beekeeper, who who kind of came back from a trip, and about three weeks later he sent me this email to say, you know things have been so bad. You know he said look. Um, you know, my bee numbers are dwindling, you know, there's no brood, um, there's no honey in there. And about a week later, I went and looked at his graphs that we were reading, you know, he was in the Apis mellifera scutellata area of South Africa, and I was in Cork, and I looked at the monitor, and I said, wait a minute, the humidity has gone up here, wait a minute, the temperature has gone up here, which tells you there's brood in there. And I wrote back to him, and I said, humidity has gone up here, he said, the temperature has gone up here, I think you should go back and look at your hives, because I think they're doing very well, you know. Um, so he, um, he sent an email back about three days later, ecstatic, to say that everything had turned out exactly like we said it would. And, um, you know, his, his pies had turned around. So, you know, working in South Africa, that, that was interesting for that one. But that's, you know, for biological reasons and given the fact that USA has got almost all the conditions honeybees are kept in, that was, that was important. I think, Fiona, you might have another one or two to add to that. Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, one one of the things that we were really excited to do uh, when we started out Apis Protect was work with, um, you know, commercial beekeepers, large scale commercial beekeepers. And I think that the USA has scaled beekeeping up to a, to a scale that I don't think we see anywhere else uh, on Earth. I mean, like operations, we, there's an operation that almost has 100,000 beehives. Um, so the, we concentrated initially on the US because we were really excited to, to use this technology to make a dramatic impact on those those really large scale beekeepers um, because we saw that they, they had the most to gain from labor savings essentially in their operation. Um, and then our, our, our smaller scale, our hobbyist technology, which is what's available in Ireland uh, right now, that you know, that we're just excited to bring to beekeepers all over the world. So we've started with Ireland because that's where we live and we'll be going to more countries as soon as we can. <laughs> um, let's see, does, uh, do the sensors assist in pest detection, mainly the wax moth? I might add myself here, uh, the wasps. Yeah, no, um, it, well, Podrick probably has more to say about this than I do. We don't specifically detect 
any problem, including um, pests. Uh, generally, what we do is we, or what we do do is we uh, draw attention to hives that are behaving differently, deviating from the norm within your operation. So that does bring you towards beehives that have problems. So while we don't specifically detect pests, like there is no sensor for a varroa mite, there's no sensor for a wax moth. Um, what we do is we say, oh, look, this one's behaving, you know, very strangely, and that could be a response to pests. So we find that generally it does attract you towards those hives with the pests, but not because it's specifically saying, hey, there's a pest over here. Yep. So um, any plans for a mobile app? Ah, that is our next big software <laughs> adventure. Uh, so right now we only have a mobile, or not a mobile, a website, so a web login. You can log into that on your phone. Uh, one of the things, I mean, like what we like to do is we pick one thing and do it right. Whole earth one thing, don't half earth two things, basically. Um, so what we want to do is create a, a perfect website and then go, hey, that, that's it, and then move on to uh, make a perfect web app. Uh, so that's certainly somewhere that we're going. Uh, it is not going to be available in the next two to three months, at least. Okay. We certainly, and when we were doing this also, we, we had to consider the fact that, you know, when we were looking at the commercial market in the United States, um, you, you have people, you know, going through hives in less than three minutes. Um, and, you know, they're wearing heavy leather gloves and if you're trying to use a, you know, a mobile phone um, with heavy rubber gloves, it doesn't work. Um, a lot of them will use paper to record the things. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, you know, unless the hive is dead, they're not going to do much with it anyway. So they, they raise in, they open it up. Is it queen right? Yes, fine. You know, they apply either antibiotics or they'll apply feed at certain times, you know, or they'll go and they'll split that. But the idea of going through frame by frame by frame to counter the all right and looking for eggs and all of those, um, they're moving too fast for that. So um, we, we felt that the person who really needs the information is the manager of all those apiaries. Uh, he or she is sitting in an office on a Monday morning and they look at our information and they'll say, I have 50 apiaries, where do I need to send my crew? So the crew mm -hmm. will travel out to that apiary with feed, with miticides, you know, with spare queens and things like that. And they lacked on that. They don't need to carry an app with them, but we do recognize that sort of a mobile phone app is, is something that the, the hobbyist market, and you know, in fairness, a couple of uh, commercial people have also asked us for that, but commercial market didn't see it as being essential at the moment. In fact, in some cases, they'd be more likely to use an iPad than a phone. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're going there, we're not there yet. A <laughs> um, couple of questions asking about the cost of the sensor. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question, and I should have put a slide in there probably with the price on it. Um, so it's €125, Euro, uh, that's including VAT, for just in case anyone's wondering about VAT, um, for the hardware itself, so for this device. And then there is a subscription cost uh, once it's activated of uh, €3.50 per month, and that's again including the VAT. Um, what's the time lag between sending data and receiving the analysis? That's a good question. Um, so the time lag to the data, so the, the, the data being on the graph is maybe a couple of minutes. It's basically the length of time it takes the, the radio to send the data over the air. So maybe a few minutes, basically real time. And um, then uh, the analysis is kind of a more overtime thing. So, you know, uh, when we're identifying outliers, it's going to need to be, you know, the temperature extreme is going to need to be away from the norm for a certain length of time. Otherwise, it would be constantly going, hey, for random spikes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how, many, how long it needs to be outside the norm to, to get a little flag, Audrey. Yeah, no, the, uh, I'm not sure that'd be yeah. our data scientists will tell us that one. There's more- Yeah, I can't um, imagine it's more than a day anyway. No, no, um, yeah. the, the, the other one is that because obviously we're trying to get your battery to last for two years, um, we, we would maybe read the data every hour and we would send it to you mm -hmm. every two hours um, so that you know, when I'm looking at the graphs here, you know, whatever's happening at 12, I'll be able to see it too. No, we can ultimately adjust that. Um, but, um, you know, certainly you're looking at the data being read um, to save, you know, the way we're saving energy and sending packages of information, we'd hold it for two hours and then send it to you from there. Okay. So much more often than you'll actually be opening your beehive. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully I always hoping there'd be hype that much. 
I have three out Aheres with seven colonies in each. How many monitors would I require? require? Okay, that's, that's a good question as well. Um, so uh, to get data about all of those um, colonies, you'd need 21 or one for every beehive. So what we what we say sometimes is that each beehive is kind of its, it's, its own universe, or it's like uh, if we were uh, monitoring Podrig's health using a heart monitor, um, we need to put the heart monitor on Podrig. You can't put a heart monitor on me and understand what's happening in, 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 in Podrig. Um, so uh, each sensor only works on the beehive that it's inside of. Um, I guess someone like that, I might recommend that they start with one apiary or something like that and evaluate the technology by using it over there for a while and then decide if you know, going from zero to 21 seems like a big step. So obviously we'd be really excited if you want to do that. <laughs> okay. How did you get around the problem of bees propolizing any holes or perforations? Presumably needed to measure That's a, That is a really good question. I think almost everyone on the team would agree that is the hardest problem that we've had to solve. Um, we've done a lot of a lot of engineering work, a lot of data science work and stuff like that, but that was the most stubborn problem. Um, so Patrick, can you hold up your device there? I have one here, but he's got the actual, mine is missing its thing. Um, so that little orange hexagon on, on Podrick's device, so that's a propolis resistant material. Uh, we spent three years putting every material we could think of into the hive and also the, the little holes in the middle, they're deliberately they are too deep, they're longer than the tongue of the bee, so they can't reach in and put propolis on the other side of, the, of that material. Um, so this is as propolis resistant as we can make it. Um, so that, that's the only material that we could find that, that the bees didn't propolize during our experiments. Um, for hobbyists, do you provide comparable data for beginners to follow? Or is this product primarily in, uh, aimed at established beekeepers with newer signs? Podrick, oh, you know the answer to that, because uh, I have what we've discussed on the team, but I don't know how much of that is officially a feature yet. Yeah, um, it's it's something we're, we're thinking about at the moment. Um, what, what we're talking about is, is that if, if we can get several beekeepers in an area, um, we, we should be able to give somebody an answer as to within your area, what you should be expecting or what, you know, your the temperatures what does, a, be, what does a good hive in your what area does a normal a normal beehive at this time in this kind of region look like and then you'll be able to compare your graph versus that graph so it's kind of a in the case of you know we had the example earlier that Podrick showed where somebody has three beehives in their apiary and you know you're comparing those beehives against each other so when you have one beehive by itself it doesn't have anything to compare itself against so what we want to do uh, once we've got enough beehives out there in the real world is go, okay, here's what everyone else's beehive was. Obviously we won't be showing beekeepers, other beekeepers beehives. That's very important. We don't share data with anyone. It's, it's an averaged, it's an anonymized averaged beehive. It's everybody's data squished together. This is what the normal beehive looks like. Um, will this work out in the sticks? I presume that's communications question. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, what we use uh, for our communication in, in our Irish deployments is a technology called narrowband IoT, which is a relative of 4G. Um, it's, it's very pervasive. It's essentially, it can travel. So it uses the 4G antennas. So, you know, the antenna that your mobile phone uh, connects to, uh, but it does travel significantly further away from the radio towers than the 4G, the traditional 4G signal does. Um, so I can't guarantee it will work everywhere. And obviously, if, if you uh, purchase a product and you find out that actually we, our network doesn't have coverage where you live, then obviously we'll take it back and refund you. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it should have very, very good coverage. I know that well, in our tests, we, we, we did struggle to find somewhere where um, we couldn't get NBIOT coverage. Um, can you check piping or quacking of the queens? Right now, no. Yeah. No, Jim. <laughs> the, the, the thing the thing about it is that you see when when you're trying to detect that that is such a short burst of information that you would have to be monitoring sound continuously 24 7 24 7 and you'd be draining your battery um mm -hmm. and, and if you decide to do it every several minutes or every several seconds the queen, you, you, you still mightn't catch it so um you know we, we we've thought about it and we're not there not yet 
Yeah, exactly. So um, essentially, we, we do provide 24 seven data, but we do that by our device wakes up every hour and it takes a look around and sees what's happening and records it and then goes back to sleep. And that's how it's able to live for so long on, on AAA batteries, whereas uh, piping and quacking is, is such a it's, a it's a few seconds of noise every couple of hours. And so you have to be looking out at that exact moment in order to catch it. So um, the, the odds of the piping and quacking happening at the exact same time our monitor wakes up is very slim. Um, so one thing that we're excited to work on um, is, is um, like swarm prevention and swarm detection. Uh, we're not quite there on that yet either, uh, but certainly um, we can, you know, you can see from the trends when, when the hives are getting quite large and when you'd want to get into um, more effective swarm management and stuff like that. So that, that's really where we're at right now. And I'm conscious that you said that you're, you've got a, a hard stop around that. So I'll just, oh, okay. I'll, just, I'll just give you a couple, a couple more questions, OK? Sure. Uh, I'm having fun. <laughs> uh, how, how, how long do you expect your sensors and equipment to last in a hive uh, in Ireland? Like um, the lifespan. Uh, so uh, we're aiming for two years of battery life and then the lifetime of this device for, uh, to be five years um, on average. Yeah. OK. Um, is it possible for beekeepers to input events which can be matched to the data which has been collected? Yes, yeah. So uh, I don't know if you saw um, there when we have the screenshot, there's a button there to add an event. And we find that that's particularly effective um, if you're recording things like when you've opened the hives for inspections or you've fed or you've changed the, the layout, you know, added a super, removed a super. Um, recording those events is really handy because it puts like that a little line and it makes a note so you can tell, uh, oh, my data went a little crazy, but then there's always a little flag there saying, actually, you opened the beehive. So that's why it went crazy. Okay. So there are some more questions, but I think they've been sort of, uh, most of them have been sort of answered to other questions. So okay. I'll leave it sure. at I did see just one person who was uh, who said that he ordered, uh, Jerry Savage was his name. So thanks very much, Jerry, for, for ordering one of our devices. And uh, you can expect an email uh, next week on the delivery date. So we're still working on a couple of things. We can't confirm a delivery date tonight, uh, but we're, we're working very hard to be able to, to give you some more information as soon as possible. So definitely at the latest next week. Okay. Um, so I just want to thank you, uh, Fiona and Patrick, for coming along, and thank you everybody else for, for attending. Um, so it's just a uh, very interesting. I'm tempted to buy one myself. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> also, also we 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 also sorry. One of the other things we have is um, we have a newsletter that you can sign up. Um, yes, sorry. That that keeps you keeps you in touch where we're going, what we're at, and in very you know I'll usually have some interesting science story in there. It'll be a link to something that I think is particularly relevant to beekeepers. Um, mm. Sometimes it's just a, a weird story. Very often there's a kind of a science background. So I was I had one article on you know the problems of trucking bees, which kind of mightn't seem too important to us, but it's of interest to know, for instance, that you know when you're trucking bees. Um, sometimes the bees get weakened very considerably because, you know, when the brood gets cold, depending on where the, the hive is on the truck, you see, when you're driving the bees along southern United States, you want to avoid them overheating because it can kill them. Um, so if you have bees too close to the inside, um, they overheat. So everybody's trying to keep them towards the outside. But if the brood gets chilled from being driven on the outside, then you arrive and you think you have a good hive of bees. But of course, all your brood has been hammered. Therefore, once you put them in almonds, you know, for the next three weeks, you're not going to get any extra bees that you'd hoped would be developing in that hive. So that, that's the field that, that still needs kind of investigation in terms of what happens. So there's, there's kind of interesting bits on that. And, uh, you know, we've sometimes some cultural bits as well. So if you go to the APIS uh, Protect website, you'll see a link. And, you know, even if you don't buy right now, um, you know, sign up for the newsletter and uh, we don't pester you or we don't ask you for money yeah. or but we don't exactly. send you letters or anything else like that. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's a once a month um, uh, email newsletter and uh, we, we, we put a lot of work into making it interesting and exciting for everyone uh, to see if you're interested in, in our adventures and also just what we're hearing the news all around the world um, about beekeepers you know we were following for example the, the, the fires in Australia uh, last year uh, and the impact on the, the beekeeping industry uh, so also if you're based outside of Ireland and you're interested in when our technology will be coming to you um, sign up to our newsletter because that's where you can find that information and uh, again 
uh, or you can go onto our website uh, to submit an inquiry. If you've got any questions, I know that there's loads more questions here and I'm, I'm just really tempted to, to just answer them all. <laughs> uh, but if you've got a question, feel free to reach out to us um, through our website. We will be happy to answer any questions that you've got. And, um, you know, uh, especially if you're like uh, considering ordering and you've got a question about how many you need or how many you want, or if you're a large scale beekeeper, um, I know that there are, I like we talk about hobbyist technology in Ireland. I know that everybody, every beekeeper in Ireland is not a hobbyist. And I, we struggled for a while trying to name the, the, the Irish product to differentiate it from the US product. Uh, and we didn't want to like upset Irish beekeepers by calling our technology over here hobbyists because we're aware that there are serious, very, very serious beekeepers I would start with and very, very large beekeepers here. Uh, so if you're in Ireland and you don't feel like hobbyist is an accurate description of, of what you do, reach out to us. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about your operation and we'll see. Um, I, I know we're talking to a, one or two beekeepers about um, using our, something more similar to our US technology, uh, which is where we use the Laura. If there was a question about Laura, um, we can work out uh, in, in certain, that's for dense deployments. So um, that might make sense in some parts of Ireland and it might not. Sorry, if I've created more questions than I've answered there, sign up to our newsletter. <laughs> okay, thank you once again. And thank you everybody for coming along. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so much, thanks everyone. everybody for the opportunity. All right, thanks. Bye bye. Yeah. Good night. Bye.